Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's Hawaii Pacific Health webinar focused on lung cancer. My name is Ian Okazaki. I'm a st uh, staff oncologist at uh, Hawaii Pacific Health, and I'm here to facilitate today's discussion. The Hawaii Pacific Health webinar event is focused on lung cancer. Topics will include prevention and screening, statistics, lung cancer statistics, and inf information specific to Hawaii, uh, current and cutting edge treatments, and how best to work with your care team to receive comprehensive treatment. Before we get started, a few reminders to our viewers. Today's webinar will be recorded, and after the event is completed, registered participants will receive a copy of the recording. This event will also be available to view on our social media channels and website. For those joining us live, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer as many of the questions as we can during the Q&A portion of the event. We are very lucky to have um, three experts on our panel join, joining us for today's discussion. Dr. Marty Taba, is a family medicine physician at Hawaii Pacific Health. She's born and raised in Hawaii and has been serving our Kailua community for over 20 years. She's chief of family medicine at Hawaii Pacific Health and um, she has a passion for uh, preventive care, um, especially prevention, preventive medicine for lung cancer. Next, we have Sam Evans. Sam is a pulmonologist at Hawaii Pacific Health. Uh, he received his pulmonary and critical care medicine fellowship at UC Davis, and he's currently the chief of pulmonary medicine at Hawaii Pacific Health, Hawaii, Hawaii Pacific Health Medical Group. And our third panelist is Dr. Keith Eaton, MD. He is professor of medical oncology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He's also professor in the clinical research division at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. He's the clinical director of thoracic head and neck medical oncology and the medical director for quality, safety, and value at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So um, let's begin. Um, you know, lung cancer is one of the most common of cancers and also one of the most um, fast growing and deadly of cancers, unfortunately. So uh, we will start by looking at some of our statistics, both here in Hawaii and nationally. And um, I'd like to ask Sam, uh, Dr. Evans, to uh, start, out, start us out with looking at some of these lung cancer statistics. Thank you, Dr. Okazaki. So in Hawaii, compared to the, the mainland US, we're actually doing pretty good on our rates of lung cancer. We're about the sixth in the nation in terms of our lung cancer um, new cases per year. So we're doing pretty well in that regard. And that, that stems in part because uh, we have less smoking in the state than say at the tobacco belt states. Um, nonetheless, in 2021, it's estimated uh, about 930 cases of lung cancer in Hawaii. And that's just under the incidence for new cases of, of women's breast cancer. Um, unfortunately, however, the, our leading cancer death uh, in Hawaii is, is from lung cancer. And we had about 540 lung cancer deaths in 2021. Uh, and that uh, also correlates with the same type of numbers nationally uh, and worldwide. Um, so I put some statistics up for you folks there. You know, it, lung cancer is a huge problem. You know, 236,000 new cases each year, and half of those, um, you know, expire within 2021. Despite our progress with newer treatments, and uh, some progress the room for improvement with early detection and, and lung cancer screening. Um, can we move on to the next slide? So at least uh, for the non-smokers, cumulative risk of dying from a lung cancer is still lower in women than men, but that gap is, is changing. Uh, and we are starting to see a higher incidence in women, even non-smoking women, uh, and 
their risk of dying is also increasing. Uh, so lung cancer are very serious. Um, so we, we have made progress in the US with smoking cessation and education, and we have been able to reduce lung cancer mortality with our newer treatments. It still remains a leading cause of cancer mortality in the nation and our number one cancer mortality in Hawaii. We do have some differences in gender between men and women, as I already mentioned. And there's also some ethnic differences as well. And we see these disparities by racial groups. You know, on the, on the mainland, we see it mostly in African and Americans. Um, but we, in Hawaii, we actually see it in native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders who tend to have a higher risk of lung cancer death compared to their Asian and Caucasian uh, counterparts. Part of this may stem from access to care, um, disparities in you know, presenting to a primary care physician, uh, asking or advocating for themselves to be screened for lung cancer. Um, unfortunately, uh, Hawaii's not so great at screening for lung cancer and, and, and you can see by different ethnic groups, we could be doing a better job with our healthcare disparities for sure. One other concern that uh, many of us have is uh, the rates of e-cigarette or vaping use in our young. So it's estimated up to 35 to 37% of middle school and high school students in Hawaii have tried these e-cigs or vaping products. And you know, the, they're advertised as being a safe alternative to smoking, but we don't know that yet. And they haven't been out long enough. Um, and we don't know all the flavorings and chemicals that are in there and whether or not they're gonna result in harm later down the road. Um, so we'll be watching this carefully. Dr. Okazaki, Thanks, anything else I can add? I, I think we'll, we'll kind of transition to our, our next important topic, which would be prevention. So lung cancer is, you know, fast growing tumor. Sometimes prevention is you know, the, the key to even getting into trouble with lung cancer. So for the preventable lung cancers, Dr. Taba, where, where should we start? I think smoking, we all know, is the big risk factor, yes? Smoking is the big risk factor. A huge preventable uh, thing that you can do is stop smoking uh, or not start smoking. Um, there are a lot of opportunities uh, to help if you're interested in stopping smoking. Um, we do have a variety of um, smoking cessation programs. Kapiolani has a smoke-free family program. There's also the Hawaii Tobacco Quit Line that is available for everyone. Um, you can see your personal physician and there are a few medications that can be helpful, um, but it is really important to commit to stop smoking. And we know a lot of people will have trouble completely quitting or quitting then starting again. But uh, it is a journey. It's a marathon, not a, not a race, but please, please keep trying. And um, quitting is really the way you can prevent. Um, Dr. Evans talked about vaping. And uh, I think it's really important to realize that we don't know the safety of vaping. And um, the nicotine content is still high, so you still could be addicted. And in my patients, I find that they both smoke and vape because it's hard to completely quit smoking. So the ads that say, you know, you'll quit smoking isn't always true. And so, you know, I do think that just quitting cold turkey is the best way. Um, and there's a lot of behavior things you can do to help yourself quit. Um, I've heard from my patients that chewing on cinnamon sticks works and it is not doesn't have calories. Um, I encourage everybody to do a physical activity instead of smoking after eating, to go for a walk after eating, to wash dishes after eating, to do something with your hands so you can't smoke. And it is just a habit. So the first 30 days are the hardest. Um, besides smoking, there are some other 
factors that can increase your risk of lung cancer. There's air pollution, there's radiation, uh, there's asbestos exposure, some diesel exhaust can potentially cause it. There is some hereditary factor. This isn't necessarily the biggest factor, but if you have a first degree family member or a family member that died in a young age, so first degree is mother, father, sister, brother, um, or if there's just multiple family members who have lung cancer, you could be at higher risk hereditarily. Um, chronic inflammation of the lung is also um, a problem and puts you at higher risk for lung cancer. So COPD or emphysema is um, a big one, which also is caused by smoking. Uh, TB can put you at higher risk uh, for lung cancer and to some degree pulmonary fibrosis. Secondhand smoke, we think, is a factor, but it's uncertain how much of a factor because we don't know the amount of smoke exposure, um, the age when you were exposed and the length of time all uh, play into that. But it's hard to say exactly how much of a factor that is, but we do think there is a factor. And you can prevent uh, by being a healthy and, and trying to live a healthy lifestyle. So clean air, um, eating fruits and vegetables, minimize your radiation exposure and your smoke exposure. Great. So patients uh, that you see uh, daily, um, the, there's a discussion that has to be had regarding, you know, screening for not, not all kinds of cancers, but for lung cancer, what are the p things that patients need to ask you? And what are the things that uh, you need to ask them to, uh, you know, figure out whether this is something that is uh, a problem that needs to be investigated. Right. So um, there are screenings for multiple cancers and we want all our patients to have them, but it can be difficult if you don't have a personal physician, a primary care physician. And that's one of the things that will be really help you to navigate screening. Uh, the second thing is we need to know as accurately as you can, what your smoking history is. A lot of times you don't want to tell the doctor maybe how long you've been smoking or how heavy you've been smoking, but that actually really plays a role into whether you qualify for screening. Although lung cancer screening is not as helpful as stopping smoking. That's what I tell the patients, right? So we want you to stop smoking also. Um, it is good to... Um, disclose to your physician about your family history. So if you don't know um, about, you know, what exactly your mom died of or anything, it'd be great to find out as that really does help us. And give us time to have a thoughtful discussion about screening. Um, it's really hard to bring this up when you have a fever of 104 or you just broke your leg. You know, it's not something either of us are really interested in talking about. So if you can schedule your annual wellness exam, if you have Medicare or a physical or some time that you can really focus on preventative care, that's going to help both yourself in your understanding of what is entailed with cancer screening and for the physician to have the time to really discuss it with you. Thanks, Marty. So Dr. Taba finds, uh, you know, something that may be suspicious or needs further evaluation. Um, uh, Dr. Evans, what are the diagnostic tests that need to be done to um, figure out if this, if this is a lung cancer? And if it is a lung cancer, you know, how, how, how advanced it is or how early it is, is it? Yeah, so uh, if a, a nodule or a mass is detected on an X-ray, or on a low dose CT, I may do a, a more dedicated uh, chest CT with a more higher resolution. Um, I may, if it's already pretty clear on the CAT scan and I can see well, I may order a PET scan. A PET scan is a little fancier than a CAT scan. Um, it tells us what is the metabolic activity of the lesion that we're worried about. And not only that one, but is there anything anywhere else that we should be worried about? And so the PET scan gives me good information on whether or not I need to biopsy the spot or I can watch it for a period of time. And also if the insurance improves it, it, it allows me to choose what's the best site to biopsy if there's more than one. Uh, and, and also the modality of, of biopsying the nodule if it is of concern. 
So in order to uh, find out what something is, you have to take a piece of it. The two main ways we do that is either the radiologist puts the patient in a scanner and numbs up the, the skin and puts a small needle through between the ribs to biopsy the nodule. Um, the other way to do that is I'll put the patient asleep and I'll put a camera, a scope through the mouth into the airways. And sometimes I can see the spot in the airway or sometimes I'll navigate out to it with a computer or sometimes I'll use an ultrasound within the airway to look through the airway if the nodule is not inside and I can't see it on the inside. That's kind of where we begin. Okay, thanks. So um, imaging the CT scan and the PET CT scan are the, you know, the modalities and uh, the, the fiber optic scope or the bronchoscopy with biopsy or perhaps having the radiologist take a um, needle biopsy using the CT image to get a piece of tissue. So getting a piece of tissue is the most, is the critical place to start. That way you can make the diagnosis of lung cancer. Um, lung cancer, of course, um, has many different stages. And the reason you do um, screening um, is to catch, catch it early. So we have stages for lung cancer and the stages for lung cancer and the type of lung cancer will actually dictate the, the type of uh, therapy to embark on. And Dr. Eden's a medical oncologist and uh, at uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And he sees these folks that uh, need to embark on some form of therapy. So Dr. Eden, if you wouldn't mind um, starting out with uh, what our staging protocol it, uh, protocols are and uh, how we ma uh, manage to embark on therapy or treatment options. Yeah, so once a, a diagnosis of lung cancer uh, is established, uh, the next thing we wanna do is figure out the stage of the patient so we can get them to the right treatment. And that's done typically through imaging. Uh, so we, we talked about a PET scan, which can tell not just where it is in the lung, but at other sites. Sometimes we'll do an MRI of the brain to see if it's uh, spread there. That means a specialized uh, test. Sometimes we'll even do what's called surgical staging to look in the uh, center part of the thoracic cavity to see whether there's lymph nodes involved there. And based on those investigations, we put a patient in a stage and there are four stages. In stage one lung cancer, there's a lesion in the lung, which is not too big, and there's no associated lymph nodes. Um, in stage two, there's a lesion in the lung that it may be bigger, and there is a, uh, maybe a lymph node in the lung. And in stage three, again, bigger lesions or involvement of more lymph nodes. So those are, those are stages one through three. And then stage four cancers are cancers that have spread to areas uh, outside of the lung, uh, such as the bone, liver, uh, or other sites, or are in liquid form within the chest cavity. Um, and we have different modalities that we use based on uh, the stage. So I'll talk briefly about uh, some and then kind of get into more detail. So the, what, the first modality uh, historically was surgery. And you know the idea behind surgery is, is for uh, cancers that haven't spread and can be taken out, uh, the surgeon goes in and uh, performs an operation and gets out all of the gross tumor, all the tumor that we can see. Um, and so surgery is an appropriate uh, treatment alone for stage one cancer, so for an early stage cancer. Uh, more recently, uh, for uh, early stage cancer, there is also uh, radiation. And this particular kind of radiation is called SBRT, which stands for stereotactic body radiation therapy. This is a, a, a shorter course of higher dose radiation that's very focused on this one spot. And this is all an option uh, for patients that are uh, not uh, fit for surgery because of other medical problems or uh, just decide they don't want surgery based on their preferences. And it it's getting to the point where for a stage one lung cancer, the evidence is almost as good for that. Uh, we still tend to favor surgery. Uh, for a stage two cancer, uh, the, the standard of care would be surgery. But in this case, we'll also add an additional systemic therapy. And I'll talk about what those are. 
as what's called an adjuvant. And adjuvant means something in addition to either the surgery or possibly to radiation. And that's meant to address the lung cancer that we can't see. So even when uh, uh, we've done all of our fancy tests and try to look to see if cancer is in other places, sometimes it's hiding out in microscopic amounts in different parts of the body. And the idea behind adjuvant therapy is it would work to kill those spots and to increase the chances that the surgery or radiation that's been performed uh, is, uh, is going to be uh, more likely to affect the results we want, which is cure. Um, in stage three lung cancer, this is either bigger tumors that are on structures that can't be uh, cut out or um, involvement of lymph nodes, which makes it at higher risk for recurrence. Uh, there are, uh, are a number of things that can be used. Almost always we will use an adjuvant therapy, so a systemic therapy, and radiation or surgery can be used, or radiation and surgery sometimes. We tend to favor that, uh, you know, what we call trimodality, three ways of treating someone less in, in that uh, kind of lung cancer. Um, and then finally, there's stage four lung cancer, which generally we will treat with only systemic agents. The purpose in uh, stage four lung cancer is to help people live longer and better. But unfortunately, for the most part, we're not able to cure patients with stage four lung cancer. There are rare exceptions, uh, but in general, the purpose of stage four treatment is to um, render the patient uh, uh, so that they have a longer uh, life expectancy than they would without those treatments. And now I was going to, uh, Ian, is it okay if I launch into systemic therapies? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's a good, good so, segue. Yeah. So I, I alluded to uh, the, this idea of systemic therapy. So these are things that circulate throughout the whole body. Uh, they can be given as, in pill form for some of the agents and uh, through an IV uh, for other agents. And part of uh, the interesting thing about this is we talk about personalized medicine and personalized cancer medicine. Um, and we try to tailor the treatment to the specific characteristics of the patient's tumor and also to patient related characteristics such as how well are they? Do they have other serious medical conditions? And also what are their personal preferences? If someone tells me I don't wanna lose my hair, there may be a specific kind of chemotherapy I can use to do that or I, I don't wanna take chemotherapy. Many people have that as an idea in their head. And so we tailor the treatment based on a number of factors. And one of the emerging uh, factors that's really found its way in lung cancer is uh, molecular testing of the tumor. And this takes two forms. One is uh, what we call uh, genetic uh, testing. So uh, just as every human has a unique set of DNA, uh, their tumor inherits most of that, but there are, are, you know, in, in the very small percentage where it's changed, which makes it cancer, those specific mutations sometimes will lead us to options to treat it. So for example, the most common uh, mutation, which we call a driver, meaning if you have it, it, it's one of those things that if we turn it off, the cancer can't continue to grow, is something called EGFR, the epidermal growth factor receptor. And in never smokers, this is quite a common mutation. Um, and so we won't know to treat for it unless we test for it. And there are about uh, almost 10 other specific mutations that we can test for that would have specific treatments, most of which are pills uh, that can be very effective and have really changed the way we treat cancer. And then the next kind of targeted or uh, personalized therapy is what's called immunotherapy. The purpose of immunotherapy is to turn up the body's natural immune system uh, in order to fight the cancer. So it, the immune system would recognize the cancer is what we call not self. The immune system is constantly discriminating between an invader, like a bacteria or a virus, and yourself. When the body attacks yourself, that's called autoimmune disease. And that's uh, unfortunately a, a, a side effect of these medicines. But when we can turn up the immune system enough to attack the cancer and not the, the person who the cancer is living in, that can result in some very uh, important uh, uh, beneficial effects uh, for the patient. So that I've talked about targeted therapy and immunotherapy. And it, it turns out that immunotherapy, we can predict how helpful it's gonna be by doing a special kind of uh, staining or testing on the tumor. 
And so that will help us triage patients uh, to that therapy. And then finally, we have uh, chemotherapy. And so these are, uh, you know, these are drugs that many of which have been around for a long time, uh, some of which are newer, uh, but they still have an important place in uh, treating of uh, cancer patients. Uh, and so these, all of these therapies have found their way into the treatment of uh, metastatic lung cancer, and more so now than ever into the treatment uh, in the adjuvant setting for earlier stage lung cancer. Um, and so it's important uh, in a patient that has lung cancer to get all of the information, put the patient in the appropriate stage, uh, figure out which of those treatments uh, would be most helpful, and then have a, you know, a, a conversation in which the patient and the family and the doctor all get together to try to understand what the best options are for treatment. Uh, and the other thing that I will mention is an important part of what an oncologist does is uh, supportive and palliative care. So I like to say that I don't just treat the cancer, I treat the patient. And so cancer and cancer treatment comes along with a significant uh, burden of symptoms. And there's lots that we can do for that. And by working with your doctor and their team, uh, the successful management of those, uh, treat, of those symptoms can make a huge difference in person's quality of life. And that's what we're, we're trying to achieve. Thanks, Dr. Eaton. So I think, um, as you can tell, the treatment options for lung cancer, and particularly advanced lung cancer, has uh, expanded and exploded quite a lot in the last uh, several years. And um, you know, Dr. Eaton's been around to see that evolve. And I think it's, it's quite exciting to know that as time goes on, there they're targeting more and more of these mutations and uh, having you know positive results. So that that's always hopeful for everybody that uh, is living with lung cancer and for families that are caring for folks with lung cancer. So um, you know the, the you can see that this is quite a quite an endeavor, and you have uh, screening or well, prevention that's ultimately important, but also screening and diagnostics and then treatment. So you know, Dr. Taba, you know the. You clearly need to have a team surrounded you, surrounding you for for you know getting point, patients from point A to point B. How how just explain how you've been doing it in the Hawaii Pacific Health System and how you um, incorporate doctors like Dr. Evans and even Dr. Eden. All right. Well, first I wanted to mention um, that it starts with you, the patient, or the family member uh, to either help patients come to see their primary doctor or if you have certain symptoms to let your doctor know. So we do screening for lung cancer, but there's also detection if you have symptoms, right? So if you have a persistent cough for no reason, if you've had weight loss for no reason, you're not trying to lose weight, if you have blood when you cough up mucus a lot um, or fever for no reason, please let your doctor know so they can do the appropriate testing. Um, sometimes you'll have kind of a, a weird chest pain or you get winded faster than you think you should, or even if you have a persistent hoarse voice that could alarm, you know, be a sign that something's going on. So let your doctor know. Um, once your doctor knows, or if you're doing lung cancer screening because you have a risk factor for lung cancer screening, which right now is if you're between 50 and 80 years old, if you've had 20 pack years, which I'll explain in a minute, or if you're still smoking, or if you quit 15 years or less, then that's when we'd like to screen you for lung cancer. Um, the pack years is how many packs per day you smoked and the amount of years you smoked that. Um, so that's how we do a, a simple calculation of packs times the amount of years you smoked. Um, so if you have been screened or you have symptoms, usually I will order the appropriate tests, which is usually it either a low-dose CT, which is if you're lung cancer screening, or a chest X-ray and a more dedicated CT scan if you have symptoms. And if a spot is found, then that's where I usually will ask my pulmonology con uh, contact, so Dr. Evans, or uh, somebody to take a look at the scan and help me determine the next step. And um, I help by communicating directly with you, my patient, and the specialist to bridge that, um, to have the specialist who I trust to um, really guide us in our next step testing. And my goal is to get you testing 
and a consult in a very timely manner so that you'll have, so, so my consultant has the data he or she needs to then take the next step, right? And so there's hopefully no gap. There are sometimes, unfortunately, authorizations, insurance stuff that we have to do to make sure we can get these tests done. And you know the best place to get it done and how quickly we can get the result. All that stuff is where you should lean on your primary care physician to help uh, guide your way through the medical maze and things where you usually don't navigate. Um, and then after that, uh, pulmonology will help us get a piece of it if needed, um, and then analyze and then decide uh, the next step to send you to, if it is cancer, to send you to oncology. Um, and all along the way, your primary care physician should be available for questions because, you know, you talk to your specialist and then, oh, I forgot that question. So you can always ask us if it's hard to reach the specialist or, um, you know, because a lot of times we're on uh, my chart or on email. So we're very, very available. We'll help you find the answer to the question. Uh, it's really important, I think, to feel comfortable with your team. Um, and a lot of times in oncology, there's a whole host of help as well with uh, navigators and people that can really help you understand, navigate, and, and get your questions answered. But if you just uh, feel like you need a second opinion or you feel that um, you need somebody, you're not really connecting with the specialist, it's really important to get someone you're comfortable with and, and a team you can trust. So that's also where you want to talk to your personal physician about, you know, be truthful about it, because this team is going to help, you know, really save your life, take care of you in the long term. And so you want somebody who you're really comfortable with. Excellent. Good, good points, Dr. Tala. And Sam, I know you always work very quickly. Uh, when, could you give everyone a time frame of how, how things should, should transpire so that uh, if diagnosed, uh, they know what to expect? Yeah, so... Um... We don't do a great job of getting lung cancer diagnosed and started on treatment here in Hawaii. Um, our statistics um, show that there's plenty of room for improvement, uh, particularly with our outer island patients. There's often long delays that's not necessary. So if Dr. Taba sends me a patient with a mass or a nodule in the lung, I try to see them you know, within five to seven days, if not in person, then by televideo. And, uh, and then I'll start lining up the, whether or not they're going to need a diagnostic procedure. So I may get a PET scan. And then if, if that looks worrisome, order either the CT guided biopsy, or I'll do the bronchoscopy myself. Um, that's usually done within seven to 10 days. Uh, and then it takes a few days to get the pathology, the results of that tissue back. Um, and once I see that diagnosis, then I will make an immediate referral to oncology, thoracic surgery, if appropriate, radiation oncology, and schedule that MRI of the brain um, to move forward with their staging and treatment. So I try to get them lined up with all of these things right before they see the oncologist uh, to make their treatment more timely, because um, time is an, of the essence. And at the same time, I'll make follow-up with me. So after they've seen the oncologist and the other parts of the team and they're on a treatment or on a plan, I'll continue to watch them for complications of treatment that Dr. Eaton mentioned. They might get uh, fibrosis or interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis from their treatment. Sometimes patients with lung cancer will get fluid around the lung that needs to be taken care of and drained, and, and I'll address that issue. Sometimes the patients will have tumor inside the airway that's blocking the airway and maybe causing pneumonia behind it. There's techniques I can use with lasers and stenting to keep that airway open and, and palliate their symptoms. Um, so that's kind of the timeline for me. Okay, thank you. And I think uh, also that with uh, Dr. Taba mentioned uh, navigator or navigation and at Hawaii Pacific Health, each of our, most of our cancer types do have a navigator, a nurse navigator that will help to direct traffic from um, diagnosis uh, to um, you know, physicians like Dr. Evans and ultimately to a medical oncologist. Um, Dr. Eaton, I think you, you know, at Seattle, you have your, your, your team you know, and they work similarly. And uh, anything from, from your standpoint, as far as, you know, getting patients, you know, through the process um, in the 
you know, smooth and calm yeah, manner, it, I guess. It, it definitely can be challenging and it, it does uh, take um, a well-oiled system and not, and, you know, depending, uh, there, there can be, you know, all it takes is one uh, part that's not functioning to make, to kind of uh, speed, th to mess things up. What I would say is, is that, you know, of course you, you want a doctor that can advocate for you, uh, um, but it's also important to advocate for yourself or for, uh, or for your family member. If something doesn't seem right, this is not a situation in where you don't want to speak up. Um, you know, what, what, I, um, what I tell my patients, you know, I have the, the you know, the kind of the, the luxury of having a, a pretty well-staffed team. Uh, once they kind of uh, are with me, they found their home in a way, and I can kind of coordinate anything. But there's not very much uh, care coordination that needs to happen, but sometimes the journey to get there can take quite a while. Um, and it's, it's, it's not uncommon to have delays, unfortunately. And so as a medical system, you know, one of our issues as a country is we have a very fragmented medical system. You know, you could be treated by doctors that are in various systems and you're working with different insurance. And so it can make it quite, uh, put up a lot of barriers. Um, you know, hopefully over time that these things will become less, uh, but it is the reality of the systems that we live in. So, you know, the, in, in addition to Dr. Eaton being a, you know, one of the national experts in lung cancer, we have him here because uh, at Hawaii Pacific Health, we, we are one of their affiliates. And so I'll just mention that, that we utilize uh, our co colleagues at, at uh, University of Washington quite frequently. And it's sometimes it's for the real, the, the complicated or tricky case, but sometimes it's just reassuring to have a, an, another set of eyes looking in our second opinion. So uh, our medical oncologists will contact uh, Seattle, and they have a, their navigation process, and, and they, they'll get they'll get you in a timely manner for a uh, second opinion. Often it's through telehealth because we have the luxury of telehealth nowadays. So, um, you know, it, it's not just Dr. Eaton. He he has a he has his colleagues, and so uh, and you know we 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 trust them all. So you know yes. when, whenever they come back, <laughs> whenever they come oh, back right. to us, they 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 give us a call, and so everyone on the team, including the Seattle folks, are on the same page. Um, you know, we, I, I think I'd like to leave some time for question and answer. Uh, we, you, we've covered a lot of territory. Um, you know, some of the, can't, the questions that are coming in are actually quite good. There, there's a, a issue of secondhand smoke because, you know, it's not just being non-smoker, but you might be surrounded by smokers. And a, a, another question, which we probably don't have an answer for, but secondhand vaping, um, what, what happens with that? So Marty, maybe you can, can uh, fill us in on a little bit about secondhand smoke. Well, like I said, we don't know exactly what is the critical mass of secondhand smoke, but we do think it is the age that you were exposed, the amount of years, and how much exposure you had, right? So the um, families who ask the smoker to leave the premises and go smoke, you know, down at the street and, and not smoke in the car, that kind of stuff is all extremely helpful. I think um, some of our state and federal mandates where people can't smoke at work, can't smoke in an airplane, uh, you know, have greatly helped us um, because before you were kind of, you know, sitting, uh, a sitting duck for those kinds of things. So, um, so if you do have a smoker in the family uh, to, you know, make it a policy for the family's health to uh, not smoke in the vicinity of the kids or in the car, I think it's gonna be very helpful. Um, Vaping again, we I, we don't know. I think, but my daughter uh, is a high school student and tells me these horror stories of kids smoking in class. Um, they smoke, they blow the smoke out in their backpack, and it's just incredible to me. <laughs> and um, and I mean, if you think about this, about you know, a lot of cancers arise from inflammation, right? And so, um, you know these chemicals going into the lungs have got to be doing some kind of inflammation. And again, we don't know, but we can't say, nobody in the medical field can say that vaping is safe, um, that the e-cigarettes are safe. Um, again, as much fresh air you can get um, and unpolluted air, the better. I think also for everyone to realize that our state legislature and legislatures across the country, uh, there's been tobacco legislation and they've all been supporters 
of that and uh, organizations such as the American Cancer Society also very much involved in legislation, but also including uh, regarding vaping. Um, you know, there's a question about um, other causes of lung cancer, one specific was radiation. So sometimes we have folks who've had treatment for other types of cancers and have had radiation therapy. Is there that added risk for you know, lung cancer, Dr. Eaton? Yes, so certainly, you know, so radiation, it's, it's unquestionable that radiation causes cancer, okay? Uh, and where we see this most in lung cancer are uh, survivors of breast cancer or uh, Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma uh, who have received radiation to the chest and then, you know, clearly have a lung cancer in an area of the lung that's been radiated. So that, in those cases, it seems pretty clear. There are other sources of uh, radiation in life. So just by living on earth, <laughs> you uh, receive a fair amount of uh, radiation from outer space. Uh, it turns out people in the airline industry are higher up and have less shielding and, and have higher cancer rates, presumably because of higher radiation uh, exposures. And then uh, there are radiation exposures. Some people have radiation exposures for work, typically workplace radiation uh, uh, exposures are kind of limited to twice the, the normal dose that you'd receive uh, during the course uh, of your life, uh, of your, you know, a normal year. Um, and then there's diagnostic radiation that we use uh, for uh, medical purposes. Um, this probably contributes a very small amount to cancer in general. It's not known, you know, so certainly at some point, uh, radiation the risk of getting a cancer is what we say dose responsive. So the higher the dose of radiation, the more likely you are uh, to get it. Um, but um, it's unclear that it, at lower doses, if there's like some threshold that you have to get past in order to really start getting the risk. The other uh, source of radiation, which is not a risk factor for lung cancer, but is a risk factor for melanoma and other skin cancers, which is most relevant to Hawaii, is ultraviolet radiation. And, and so that's a source of radiation that is, uh, you know, you can mitigate this and, and probably living in Hawaii, that's your most uh, modifiable risk factor. And to, tell me what you would say to your, your, the patients who are cigar smokers, because they, yeah. they, so technically, cigar, technically they might not inhale as much, right? right? Well, cigar <laughs> smoking is, uh, you know, depending on how you smoke it, it may or may not be a risk factor. Uh, you know, you don't see very many cigar smokers these days, or at least I don't. I, I, uh, but it is definitely a, a risk factor for uh, oral uh, cancer and head and neck cancer, which we didn't talk about today, but is a very um, difficult to have cancer, can be quite uh, disfiguring, uh, and uh, uh, patients can be have a high degree of symptom burden. So uh, that would be another one that I would avoid. Okay. And, you know, our, we have a rising incidence of non-smoke, non-smokers getting lung cancer. Do, do they actually present at a later stage because they're non-smoking? Maybe they have the... Uh, red flags aren't up as early for them, perhaps? So the answer is, I definitely see, you know, I have definitely seen this. So awareness that uh, never smokers uh, can get lung cancer is um, not very uh, high in the general population or even in the, you know, medically savvy population of doctors and nurses and other health professionals, you know, because the association of uh, lung cancer and smoking is so uh, significant. So a smoker is at 30 times uh, the risk as a, as a never smoker to get lung cancer. But uh, one thirtieth of a very big number is still a pretty significant number. Um, and as there are less and less uh, smokers, so smoking uh, incidence in men and women has peaked, uh, you know, uh, 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 a while back. And, you know, the, the, the lag, uh, is uh, 20 to 30 years uh, from starting smoking to when you start to really get uh, smoking at a significant rate. And so we're seeing declining rates of lung cancer uh, in, uh, that are smoking related. And so the, the relative uh, proportion is higher for reasons that are not understood um, in Asians, especially in Asian females, th there is a higher rate of never smoking lung cancer. So. You know, when I review a paper sometimes from uh, China, I'm just surprised to see, you know, the very high incidence of these never smoking cancers. 
Um, it may also have to do with, you know, smoking patterns there too, where women are much less likely to smoke, at least historically. But the, the exact uh, reasons for this are unclear. Environmental causes uh, may be a factor, uh, but it, uh, it doesn't explain the, uh, the, the, effect, the effect of your ethnic origin. Dr. Evans, you know, the lung nodules that are detected on these CT sc screening CT scans, you know, I realize, realize that uh, we used to use chest x-rays for screening lung cancer, and that's still viable if you don't have access to a CT scan machine. But if you find a nodule on a CT scan, are there, are there protocols for following these nodules? You know, do they go away on their own? Um, what, what do people have to watch for? Yeah, so there's a lot of things that can that can be a, a pulmonary nodule. It's not just lung cancer. So certain types of infection can do it. Uh, something that you inhaled, like a spore from a mold or a particle of dust can do it. Uh, even autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid disease like to make nodules in the lung. And so it can be quite tricky. Um, there are guidelines for how to follow these things. It's called the Fleshner Society Guidelines. And so what it boils down to is what's the appearance of the nodule? How worrisome is this? Is this smooth and calcified and it was there 10 years ago on an x-ray? Or is this spiculated and star-like and just showed up recently when it wasn't there you know, a, a year ago? Um, and is it growing or is it staying the same over time? And so also patients' risk factors, did they smoke a hundred pack years or are they a never smoker? Do they have a family history of lung cancer? Have they had other cancers that can go to the lung? So all those things matter. And, um, but more often than not, for the smaller nodules, I'll follow them over time, two years, three years, four years, periodically checking on them. And uh, if we're lucky, they go away. Often they stay the same. And sometimes as in like a mycobacterial infection, they'll wax and wane, they'll come and go. Old ones will vanish, new ones will pop up. And so the business of pulmonary nodules is tricky, um, but you just have to stay on top of it and be vigilant. Speaking of diagnostics, um, Dr. Eaton, you know, we use these uh, blood tests now to, to look at gene mutations and all those things regarding, you know, not just lung cancer, but other types of cancers, because it helps us direct therapy. Now, the, the natural question, and we do see these from, from our audience, is can those use be, uh, tools be used as screening tests? Um, okay, I, I wanted to just pick up on something from Dr. Evans first. So one of the things he mentioned is algorithms for following uh, patients with CT scans uh, for lung cancer screening. One thing that I would highly recommend is seeing someone or work in a system in which uh, there are algorithms for, for doing this. So in the absence, you know, if you just see someone and they're kind of ad, doing it, you know, making it up as they go, let's say, not following the criteria, it, it, there's the potential to, uh, to, to cause harm. Uh, and these algorithms have been uh, created uh, to minimize harm. And they were kind of uh, what the basis of how the, uh, the tests were done to show that this was helpful. So it's important to see someone who's expert in this area so that you get the proper follow-up from an abnormal result. And an abnormal result from a screening scan is not at all unlikely. Um, so that's part of the conversation that doctors have with their patients before engaging in, in, in lung cancer screening. That said, in the right population, Lung cancer screening is really one of the best screening tests that we have. Uh, in the population that led to the approval of this, um, the, uh, the people who were screened versus the people who didn't had a 7% greater overall survival, which is really incredible uh, in, this, in the screening setting. So to, to the question that you asked about blood cancer tests for screening, there really are no tests that are approved for this. I would say uh, a couple of years down the road, uh, this may happen. Uh, the company that's furthest along on this is a company called Grail. And they're, they're really screening for a number of different cancers in the blood. And they're doing an enormous study of uh, 100, you know, 100, over 100,000 patients following people prospectively to see whether or not they can uh, detect cancer. Now, 
One of the criticisms of these tests is, is that they're better at detecting late stage cancers than early stage cancers. Um, you know, detecting a late stage cancer in the, what we would call a preclinical stage, meaning before it's caused symptoms and the patient is presented may have some value, but certainly seeing a patient even earlier when it's at an early stage, when we have the likelihood of curing them is even more valuable and we're not there yet. Uh, is uh, from my read of the literature, but that, that's coming. And the other area in which tests are not yet approved, but may come to fruition soon is in the evaluation of pulmonary nodules. There can be some, what we call companion diagnostics. So if a patient had a, a nodule on CT, it may be that we would do a blood test that may help us uh, discriminate uh, what the next best step for that is. But we, we have a, a pretty good way of, uh, processing these tests now, it, you know, it's not perfect and it certainly can be improved, but I think, you know, lung cancer screening is a, is a fairly mature technology at this point. And if you keep your, uh, or put your Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center cap on, um, medical marijuana or mar marijuana smoking in general, you know, we talk about cigarette smoking a lot and, and also vaping, um, risks associated with that, that we know of? Um, when I, I haven't reviewed the literature lately, but when I last reviewed the literature, it's hard to make that uh, association because of the nature of how marijuana is smoked in contrast to how cigarettes are smoked. If you were to look at the pack year equivalent, right? It's really hard to get a pack year of marijuana in. That's a lot of marijuana. And uh, so, uh, but presumably, you know, marijuana is a combustible, you know, one of the things that makes tobacco such a great carcinogen is that really you're setting something on fire and breathing it in. And so the kind of chemistry that that produces, it, it is really a, uh, a rich uh, array of chemicals that are produced. Uh, and amongst those many chemicals that are produced, some of them are carcinogens and the continued exposure to carcinogens is what makes you cause cancer. It makes uh, cancer happen. Now, presumably this too is a dose uh, effect um, and so if you smoked enough marijuana, certainly it'd be a risk. Uh, it's just the, at the lower levels that people tend to smoke marijuana, we have not seen that association or it's not as clear as tobacco. But one of the things that I tell people is it took decades to prove that smoking causes lung cancer. That's, that's the way epidemiology works. Um, you know, you need a, a lot of data. Uh, we're better at getting that kind of data um, but things that we think are obvious now actually still are, are hard to show. So just because something hasn't yet been proven to be harmful does not mean that it's not harmful. Uh, briefly, Dr. Evans, uh, there, there's some actually thoughtful questions about, you know, Marty, Dr. Tabo has mentioned inflammation in the lung. So a lot of these lung diseases that you see as well, interstitial lung disease and even the, the COPD, um, the, those carry risks, I guess, of lung cancer as well because of the chronic inflammation. Is that is that something that uh, is always thought of when you're when you're following these patients? Yeah, certainly. I, I definitely see it um, in my idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis patients. You know, their their fibrosis may be progressing, and I may be watching it on a CT, and then you know, a year, or two years down the road, something will pop up, and it, it turns out to be a lung cancer. And so, yeah, I am a believer in the inflammatory milieu causing the breaks in the DNA and a mutation and that starts the cancer. Um, I, and I believe in the radiation too. I, I just recently had a 49 year old jet pilot get diagnosed with a stage one lung cancer, never smoker, but he flew the F-18s way high up in the atmosphere for decades for the military. And lo and behold, he got a nodule, turned out to be a lung cancer. And Dr. Tabo, some final thoughts. I think, you know, lung cancer is, is a big, big problem, not just in the state, but nationwide, as far as, you know, people having a little bit more awareness about it. Maybe it might be symptoms and maybe other things. What should they, what should they, how should they get, get a hold of your group and the primary care physicians? Thanks. I had a couple uh, thoughts. One is lung nodules are so common 
and often are okay. And it's very hard to wait for that one year repeat CT. So know that, you know, at Hawaii Pacific Health, for sure, we're following algorithms that have been proven. So if we ask you to wait a year, it's okay, you know. Um, but we also want to partner with you. So if you develop symptoms or if you have, you know, something that doesn't feel right, you need to let us know um, so that we can, you know, take a double look at it. Also know that these nodules are tiny a lot of the time, so they're not biopsyable, if that's a word. And so that monitoring is the right thing to do, although it can be the hardest thing. So a lot of people have a lot of anxiety, understandably about that, but know that, like Dr. Evans said, they are created from a lot of different things. It is scary. Um, people are very concerned about radiation, uh, medical radiation, and I will say that the, your physicians are very, very aware of this. So we are not going to recommend, um, you know, excessive radiation studies, and that's often why we're reluctant to order, you know, CTs every week or something like that, you know, so we're very reluctant to order CTs in children, for example, for that re very reason, young adults, if we can get at our answer in a different way, we will. But if we need the CT, know that we're really thinking that that's what you need. And so, you know, the mammograms are, are valuable. So I know there's a bit of radiation there, but the value there is, is, high, is way higher than the relatively small amount of radiation you get for something like that. Um, so, you know, it's a balance of things and we do uh, want to weigh the risk versus benefit. And that's why we counsel you on that way. But always good to ask questions. And if you don't have a primary care physician, please get one because these are the people that, and, and sometimes you have to try on a few to find the right person. And that's okay because we're all different people and we all connect differently with physicians and, and it's okay. But that would be the gateway into the medical system, which can be convoluted, confusing, uh, very difficult if the system is not talking to each other. Um, which is why, you know, if you have a connected system, which uh, Dr. Eaton, I assume you're on EPIC. So, you know, these coordinated cares just make it so much easier instead of losing the facts or finding, you know, where's the CT, you know, it's much easier to coordinate if we have a system that talks to each other. So that, that can't be discounted. And Dr. Eaton, for maybe the last minute or so, is there any final thoughts, maybe, um, that you have for the something exciting that you see coming in the future, or even how, how best to manage symptoms as you know people evolve through their lung cancer journey. Well, you, you know, I think one of the themes that's come through is it's important to have a good working relationship with your your team, um, to have open and honest communication, um, you know, to elicit people's um, understanding and and what their preferences are uh, throughout this you know so people on uh, you know with cancer uh, you know one of the things that I that I say is you know talking is one of the more important things that I do that's that's what won't be replaced by a computer or technology and 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 that relationship especially for patients with more advanced cancer but this is a, a scary business and I think having the um, Ability to talk to your doctor, your care team is, is really one of the most important things. Okay, well, you know, I'd like to thank our panelists of experts uh, who took the time today to provide their uh, insights and expertise uh, for our viewers and the patients watching at home. Um, hopefully you're able to take away some helpful information that will help you focus on cancer prevention as well as uh, screening and uh, diagnostics and treatments that are needed for the specific type of cancer that may come up, come upon you or one of your loved ones. As you heard throughout today's program, Hawaii Pacific Health offers comprehensive services that can support the medical needs of you and your family. Uh, virtual care via video or phone are also available. Um, In-person visits are also welcome. So uh, we are focused and fixed on keeping everyone healthier. Um, if you have questions regarding our services or today's webinar, please visit the hawaiipacifichealth.org website. And thank you for joining us today. Have a safe and healthy holiday coming up. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>